what does this airplane, this airplane, and this airplane all have in common? Let's find out in Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machette. By request, my thanks to viewer John Simons for suggesting the idea for this presentation. This is an amphibian, this is a float plane, and this is a flying boat. And they're all seaplanes. And we're going to be talking about seaplanes and flying boats in this presentation. However, I have an announcement. Every time I do these compilations, I always get the feeling that I'm working on a one hour TV presentation of the history of the entire world. And I'm trying to get so much information into a 20 minute video. Inevitably, there are going to be airplanes that are missing. So what I'm going to do is give you a representation of the significant aircraft in the history of seaplanes and flying boats. So let's get started. We're gonna be showing you sport airplanes, the great flying boats of the 1930s and unique seaborne aircraft throughout history. Let's start at the beginning with Glenn Curtis and the Model E in 1911, acknowledged as the first true seaplane able to take off and land from water. In 1914, the St. Petersburg Tampa Airboat Line created the first scheduled airline service in the United States. For the princely sum of $5 per trip, you could fly between these two cities in a Benoit airboat that had a passenger capacity of one. Only eight years after building the Model E, Glenn Curtis's company designed and built four giant twin engine NC flying boats for the United States Navy. N stood for Navy, C for Curtis. The NC-4 became the first aircraft to successfully fly across the Atlantic, departing Naval Air Station Rockaway, New York on May 8th, 1919 and landing in Lisbon, Portugal, 19 days later. The Schneider Cup series began in 1913, and this was using small lightweight seaplanes to advance the technology and increase the speed of these machines in a racing circuit uh, held every year. The winner of the 1913 race flew at 47 miles per hour. In 1925, the Supermarine S-4 flew 227 miles per hour at Baltimore, Maryland. But the winner of that race was Lieutenant Jimmy Doolittle in the Curtis Racer, achieving a speed of 233 miles per hour. The final Schneider Cup winner uh, in Calshot, England, was the Supermarine S-6B, which flew at 334 miles per hour, a very elegant looking seaplane. And then there was this machine, the Mach-E MC-72. This airplane weighed only 3,000 pounds at takeoff and was powered by a 2,850 horsepower Fiat V12 liquid-cooled engine. It held the ultimate world speed record for aircraft for five years. And to this day, it's still the fastest piston-powered seaplane ever flown. And no, I didn't put the wrong photo into this uh, presentation. Uh, this is a Douglas World Cruiser uh, seen on its wheeled landing gear. Reason being that it departed Santa Monica, California in March of 1924. Uh, and on its first stop on a round the world trip, the first time it had ever been done, it was converted to uh, seaplanes in Seattle, Washington. Uh, there were five aircraft that departed originally Three of those aircraft made it all the way around in six months with 62 stops. There was no loss of life, no major damage. Two airplanes were lost in weather accidents. And what's interesting is that the three airplanes that returned to Santa Monica in September of 1924 uh, became the logo for the company uh, from that point until the jet age in the 1960s. And the three airplanes you see uh, represented as well as the globe in the Douglas logo refers to the flight of the world cruisers. By the 1920s, uh, dreams of flying across the Atlantic and giant uh, flying boats or flying ships uh, was trying to uh, happen. 
Some designs were not successful, but others were. And here's the Dornier, Dornier DOX, which first flew in 1929. We had flying boats. This was called the flying ship. It was the world's first true giant passenger carrying flying boat, making its first flight in 1929. Three were built and were powered by 12 525 horsepower Siemens Jupiter engines. The aircraft had a Duralumin hull and fuselage, while its 150 foot long wing had an aluminum frame covered with linen fabric. The 100 passenger DOX was flown from 1929 to 1937. Here's a beautiful shot of the interior, quite, uh, quite plush. And in 1931, this airplane made a historic demonstration flight to New York. In World War II, the Blomann Voss BV-222 Viking became the largest flying boat uh, flown during that conflict. But a larger flying boat was taking shape in the United States. And this was the Hughes H-4 Hercules, built in Culver City, California, out of laminated wood. The airplane was uh, built in a large factory in Culver City and then moved by truck in eight large pieces to Long Beach, California, where it was reassembled like a giant model airplane. The H-4, known as the Spruce Goose, even though it was built out of birch, made its one and only flight on November 2nd, 1947, with Howard Hughes at the controls. After the war, giant flying boats were seen as the main means of aerial transportation since they could land at uh, seaports anywhere around the world. The Latacor 631 was one of these designs from France. 10 631s were built and the aircraft carried 46 passengers. It had a cruise speed of 245 miles an hour, but was flown by Air France until 1948 and with other companies making its final flight in 1955. An interesting looking airplane. Here's the short Sunderland, a total of 792 of these airplanes were built as cargo and troop transports. And in 1948, several Sunderlands were flown in the Berlin airlift by landing on nearby Lake Havel. Sunderlands then flew a thousand missions and carried a total of 4,500 tons of salt and critically needed supplies. The Saunders Row SR-45 Princess was the world's highest performance flying boat, having flown during test flights as fast as 380 miles per hour at 39,000 feet. Designed to carry 105 passengers on transatlantic routes, the double-deck Princess was powered by six Bristol Proteus turboprop engines and had a remarkable 6,000 mile range with a 15 hour endurance. Here's the modern looking flight deck of the SR-45. And as impressive as this airplane was, new faster land planes captured the market and the Princess never saw operational service. Saunders Row also built a jet powered flying boat, the SRA-1 in 1947. In 1953, Convair in San Diego built the XF-2Y Sea Dart. This is an interesting concept. The original configuration had one, uh, what was called a hydro ski, and that was later modified to a twin ski configuration seen in this retouched photo of the Sea Dart that's on display at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. The Sea Dart is the only seaplane in history to have achieved supersonic flight. And of course, the Martin twins, the PBM Mariner in 1940 and the P5M Marlin in the 1950s, which flew until the late 1960s. I don't know if you built a Ravel kit. I have to tell you, it's probably one of the top five models of all time. It's a fabulous, fabulous kit. In the 1950s, turboprop power suddenly became all the rage. The Allison T40 geared uh, turboprop with contra-rotating propellers was fitted to a number of different airplanes, and unfortunately, none of them were successful. But this one actually saw service with the Navy, the Convair R3Y Tradewind. 
It was a troop and cargo transport and also served as a tanker in a test with uh, four Grumman Cougars as seen here. It had an interesting uh, bow door that lifted up, ramps lowered down, and you can see the bulldozer uh, being driven out. And this is how the troops were loaded aboard as well. Wait a minute, where have I seen a scene like this? Oh yeah, that's right. Well, if you thought a turboprop powered flying boat was really cool, how about a turbojet flying boat? The fabulous Martin Seamaster. First flown in 1955, the uh, prototype seen here was really a promise of things to come. The cockpit was ultra modern for its day, very clean layout. This is the uh, Seamaster in its uh, docking unit, uh, a wheeled assembly that the boat taxis into on the water and then rolls up on land. It's called beaching gear. The production configuration P6M2 first flew in 1956 and featured upgraded engines and a military style windshield and canopy. Capable of flying more than 600 miles per hour, the P6M2 was intended as a high speed, long range photo reconnaissance platform and bomber, as well as a torpedo attack and mine laying aircraft. Although the Seamaster was canceled, there was an airplane that did fulfill that role. It was from the Soviet Union. It was called the Beriev BE-10. It flew that same year and carried out those missions for many years after. The BE-200 was a modern development of an earlier, larger design and first flew in 2003, serving today as a water bomber and commercial transport carrying up to 72 passengers. It has a top speed of 570 miles per hour. Now let's talk about amphibians. Like their namesake, they can operate on land or water. The advantage of that is, uh, as you see here, a Douglas Dolphin in San Pedro, California, could take off from the water and fly out to uh, Catalina Island, 26 miles away, landing by the shoreline and taxiing up on that ramp that you see at lower right. And then you could deplane and enjoy a nice lunch at the terminal uh, patio restaurant there, and then take a limousine into Avalon and spend a nice day, fly back that evening. Or you could see a Sikorsky S-38 here, uh, flown by Western Air Express. And this airplane would take off from Mines Field, which is now LAX or Long Beach, fly out to Catalina, land in the water and so on. So an amphibian was really a versatile way of uh, operating both on land and water. In World War II, probably the most famous amphibian was the consolidated PBY Catalina, or in a night mission uh, called the Black Cat. Grumman built a series of beautiful uh, amphibians, uh, the Widgeon and Goose, to name a few. And here we see the Grumman Mallard flying over the Statue of Liberty. Now, I apologize for the quality of this photo, but the Mallard that you see at bottom belonged to the New York Daily News. They had a operation at Zahn's Airport in Amityville, Long Island. You can see the hangar at upper left. On the night of July 25th, 1956, the Italian liner Andrea Doria was inbound to New York in heavy fog and it uh, collided with the Swedish liner Stockholm. The mallard that you see here left early in the morning and flew out to the scene of the sinking Andrea Doria. And this is the airplane that took all the historic photos that you saw in Life magazine. Tragically, 51 lives were lost in the accident, but many of the other, or the remaining passengers, thankfully, were all rescued. And speaking of rescue, how many of you built this kit? The fabulous Grumman Albatross. Queen of the May Day. I loved ads like this, really inspirational as a kid growing up. The writing uh, was fabulous. It talked about the Air Rescue Service, the US Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, flying albatrosses. And the last line says it all. Though she doesn't fit into the airman's survival kit, she's part of it. Love that stuff. And here's proof that you can win a bar bet when somebody asks if the Air Force ever flew seaplanes. Beautiful photo at Edwards Air Force Base of all places. Now, I know you've heard of Airbus, but have you ever heard of the air car? Percival Spencer was an engineer at Republic 
in Farmingdale, New York, and the company uh, acquired his design and developed it into the RC-1 Thunderbolt Amphibian that you see at lower right. This was intended for a market that never happened. They were expecting hundreds of thousands of returning pilots from World War II to want their own personal airplanes, and that market never developed. But the RC-1 was developed into a simpler and easier to produce RC-3, renamed the CB. I had occasion to fly a CB at Lake Tahoe in the 1980s, and I was amazed at how uh, agile this airplane was. It doesn't fly like it looks. It flew more like a fighter. And there was a tremendous amount of CB DNA in this airplane, the Colonial Skimmer. Uh, many of the team from Republic worked on this as a freelance project, thinking that uh, there wouldn't be much future for an airplane that looked like this. The skimmer uh, really was all the rage, and while the CB uh, was only in production for uh, a few years, uh, the, the skimmer evolved into uh, the Lake LA-4, the Buccaneer, and this airplane, the Lake Renegade, a descendant, a descendant of those earlier airplanes. This machine carried six people and was powered by a 250 horsepower Lycoming engine. And unlike the CB, as I mentioned, the Lake Amphibians were built through the end of the 20th century with military versions of the Renegade still in production today. Float planes are probably the most common of the seaplane variety. Here's a float plane flying over my hometown of New York. It appears that it's flying over the city, but in actuality, it's flying up the Hudson River. And this VFR corridor is still in operation today. Here we can see the uh, application of the floats to the uh, airframe. And this is a basic configuration of struts that is still used in today's converted seaplanes. Now this airplane is an amazing machine. The concept of launching seaplanes from ships via catapult and having them deliver mail and freight to ports well before the ships themselves arrived dates back to 1929. This elegant Art Deco design of the Gullwing HA-139 was revolutionary in 1937, and the three aircraft built were stationed aboard ships in New York and the Azores. The advantage of a catapult launch is that the airplane doesn't consume large amounts of fuel on takeoff, giving the HA-139 an impressive range of 3,000 miles. The airplane cruised at 160 miles per hour and flew the New York Azores run in 1937, and 1938. And could this be the largest float plane ever built? It's a conversion of the DC-3 or C-47 Army transport. The Douglas XC-47D technically is an amphibian, but we're going to call it a float plane here. And which one was bigger? Well, let's look at the specs. Both airplanes were 64 feet long. And the uh, 139 had an 89 foot wingspan, the C-47 95 foot wingspan. So let's just say that these two airplanes were the largest float planes ever built. At the other end of the size spectrum, you've got uh, converted single engine fixed wing aircraft like the Cessna 180. And no mention of seaplanes would be complete without the de Havilland Beaver and Otter. You see the Beaver at top with a radial engine and the Otter uh, converted to turboprop. Both these aircraft began as uh, piston powered air airplanes and then uh, were both converted to turboprop and are still in use today. Pontoon planes, what's that? Well, that's a single pontoon uh, used uh, as the float and then outrigger floats. Here's the Grumman Duck, which was an outgrowth of the Loning Amphibians. And the Vought Kingfisher, which was a scout plane uh, based aboard uh, Navy cruisers and launched by catapult. After finishing its mission, the uh, Kingfisher would land next to the ship and be hoisted aboard by crane to fly again. And now we come to the flying boats. These are the classics. And we begin with the Consolidated Commodore in 1929. A precursor of the many great consolidated flying boats to come, the Commodore carried 22 passengers and flew from Miami to South America. Near Beer, as it was called, stood for New York, Rio, and Buenos Aires. And this company became part of the Pan American 
World Airways System in 1930. Next, we have the Sikorsky S-40. And while the Sikorsky name will always be synonymous with helicopters, the company built a series of very successful flying boats, such as this 38-passenger S-40 boarding passengers in Miami in 1933. Used on Caribbean and South American routes, the S-40s flew at a stately 115 miles per hour and had a 900-mile range. Next was the Sikorsky S-42, which offered greater speed than the larger S-40 and carried 32 passengers at 150 miles per hour on routes over the Atlantic and the Pacific. Clipper names of different countries were applied depending on the routes being flown. Here's the interior of the S-42, rather posh. And next we have the Martin M-130, the iconic name China Clipper conjured up the romance and adventure of Trans-Pacific air travel in the 1930s, and the Martin M-130 certainly lived up to that role. Carrying 41 passengers on routes up to 3,100 miles allowed the M-130 to fly from Alameda, California to Manila in the Philippines in only five stops. Although much sleeker and more modern looking than the Sikorsky's, the big Martin still sported struts and wires. The answer to that problem can be seen in this flying boat concept from consolidated in the mid 1930s. But the airplane that emerged as the ultimate Pan Am Clipper was this machine, the ultra modern Boeing 314. The 314 was derived from technology leading to Boeing's legendary B-17 bomber. It carried up to 74 passengers in luxury at 180 miles per hour and had a range of 3,200 miles. Let's take a look at the cockpit of this airplane. And in every term, every sense of the term, it's really a flight deck. The crew complement at that time was a captain, a co-pilot or first officer, a radio man, flight engineer, and navigator. Five men in the cockpit guiding this aircraft across the Pacific and the Atlantic. Interestingly enough, when Pan Am flew their first jet across the Atlantic in 1958, there were also the same complement of five men in the cockpit. Some things don't change. Here's the dining salon in the 314, quite elegant. And now we come to uh, the close of our presentation with the Martin Mars. And I consider this photograph to be one of the greatest promotional photos ever taken in aviation. How did they get that J3 Cub up on the wing of the Mars prototype? First flown in 1942, the first Mars sported a twin tail configuration, much like the Martin PBM. And this evolved into the production version, the JRM-1, powered by Wright R3350 radials. A single JRM-2 was powered by Pratt & Whitney R4360s, and a total of six Mars flying boats were built and flown in Navy transport service. These aircraft had a range of nearly 5,000 miles. Two of the Mars flying boats survived through the 1950s and were converted into civilian water scooping fire bombers in 1959 based in British Columbia. Capable of carrying 7,200 gallons of water, these two aircraft were indispensable in fighting large forest fires all over the Western United States and Canada. The first aircraft named Philippine Mars was retired in 2015, while the Hawaiian Mars II seen here was retired in 2016 with 23,500 hours total time. It is currently listed for sale for $5 million. And flying boats are still flying in operation today. This is the Shin Meiwa, I hope I pronounced that correctly, PS1. A later development of this airplane is still in service with the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force. And of course, the Canadair CL-415 Super Scooper. I'll tell you, living in Southern California, these airplanes are a godsend. We see them every fire season and they have really helped in uh, minimizing the damage from wildfires in California. So if you couldn't tell, yeah, I love seaplanes. And there you have it, the stories of seaplanes and flying boats throughout history. 
I hope you enjoyed this presentation and thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Mashat. We'd love to have you subscribe to the channel if you're not already on board and please hit the like button. We appreciate that and it certainly helps with YouTube. So until next time, take care.